Thank you, Shara, uh, for that um, interesting introduction. And everyone, welcome to London. Wonderful to see everybody here, and wonderful to be back in London uh, again for our third, uh, third time in London and fourth time in Europe, as Shara said. Uh, so I, I get to open the conference, so I, uh, I try when I do this opening talk to give people a sort of a broad understanding of what WSO2 is, how we got here, what we do, how we operate, and sort of what our long-term vision is. So this is a, a fairly a, a broad conversation, and uh, throughout the course of the remaining two days, there's obviously lots of talks on different, different topics. So uh, I'm only going to touch uh, at a very high level many of the areas that we work on, and, and hopefully in the remaining two days, you'll get a chance to go to the sessions that, you, uh, that you're focused on and, and, and get a much deeper understanding of what we do and, and how things work out. So let me, uh, without, much, uh, without taking much time, let me jump in and kind of start walking you through our, our, our uh, process and our journey and get you a little bit of an introduction. So we completed 10 years last year, so I just want to kind of walk you through some of the way we've operated and how we, how we run the company in the, in the 10 years and, and uh, give you a little bit of an understanding. We started the company with 12 people. We now have almost 500 people in the company, and we operate, as Shara said, in, in seven locations. And a, and, and a group of people who are very passionate, very committed, uh, very energized about middleware, about what we are trying to do, and about the, the technology opportunity that the world is creating with, with the evolving uh, technology. <clears throat> a, the company from the beginning was set up not just as a way to reinvent technology. So Paul, I, uh, Paul walked in a little bit ago. Uh, Paul is my co-founder. And, and Paul and I used to work in IBM, IBM before. I was in IBM Research. He was in IBM Hursley. And we started this company originally with the vision of building a middleware platform. But it was more than just a technology vision. It wasn't just driven around a SOA and technology-driven orientation, but other aspects as well. Fundamentally, we want to just reinvent not only how this stuff works, but also how a company works. And we've done that, actually, in the last 10 years. One, one key thing, of course, is the open source approach. Uh, that's, a, that's a thing that's under a lot of pressure these days. You see lots of VC-type people writing all kinds of things about how open source is not a scalable business model, blah, 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 except for Red Hat, of course, right? Red Hat's always written, written as an exception. Uh, we don't buy that. We have a business model. We are scaling it. It's working. It's uh, something we believe in. Uh, we also have this global approach. We are a, a globally distributed company from day one. And a, it's not a sort of a traditional software company architecture these days where you have an outsourced engineering team kind of model. That's not our approach. We are much more a, a globally distributed approach. And, and fundamentally, we try to treat you guys, our customers, and our employees, and our partners, and our suppliers, and everyone in the same way that we, you know, as an individual that you would want to be treated. And that's really the fundamental way of doing business for WS2. We try hard not to not to treat uh, anyone as a, a sort of a, you know, a wallet that we get something out of in any way uh, or, or someone who's going to produce some work for us or anything like that. It's a lot more like, well, if I was on the other side, how would I want it to be? And we ask everyone to consider that approach. So this concept of sort of do unto others, or you would have them do to you, is very, very important in how we operate. And behind this, of course, is a whole series of things that we've developed over the years as to how we operate, the culture, the values, and the trust system that we operate on. I, I don't have time to go through that. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that we do. And, and, uh, but, but let me just touch upon a couple of things that, that are kind of different about how the company runs. And they'll give you a sense of the way we, we think about things. Uh, one, one, uh, one thing is about communication. So, so in a normal organization structure, you have this model of uh, sort of need-to-know communication basis. Uh, in, my, in my previous life, uh, if you got invited to the meeting, you were in. If you're not invited to the meeting, you were not in, basically. That was sort of the, the definition of, of whether you're in on something or not. Uh, in WS2, we wanted to create from the beginning this approach of saying, we don't want that model. If somebody has an opinion or an attitude or a view or uh, you know, a gut check or whatever they want to give about some topic, they should be able to participate. So everyone gets every email. So we literally send about 1,000 emails to every person every single day, right? So we, we luckily subscribe to Gmail right from the beginning. That works really well, can handle that volume. But it also, uh, so, so it is a lot of communication, a lot of information that it's pushed to everyone. 
Obviously, not everybody can read everything, right? That's impossible to keep up with everything, except, of course, the chief email officer, so that's me. But what it does, it also gets everyone to understand what's going on. And if someone wants to understand what is going on in the conference design or, or has an opinion or has some idea about how to run the conference, they can participate in that conversation. It's not restricted to people who are from that team. Uh, same is true about business strategy. Same is true about pricing strategy. Every, every a, a proposal that is sent to a customer is essentially is copied to everyone in the company. Obviously, not everybody goes and reads it, but it's all copied to everyone in the company. Any bug report you raise is visible to everyone in the company. Uh, I, I tell the story of one of our customers once was sort of unhappy that we were not responding or solving the, whatever the problem they had. And so they wrote this threatening thing saying, hey, we know your CEO. If you guys don't respond, we're going to write to the CEO. So then I, I had seen that message is going through. So I put a comment on the say, hey, you don't need to escalate because everything you do is actually completely visible. Right? So, so it's kind of a different model of operation. And it gets everyone to really understand and also build a system of trust, uh, which is critical for, for, for making things move fast, for building a team, and for a team to operate as a team. If you don't trust each other, you are not a team at all. right? Uh, so, so we believe in this very strongly, and it's, it's, uh, uh, it's not easy to handle when you have 500 plus people you know, fl firing away emails, it's not, not easy, but, but it, it works. Uh, we, we came from an open source background, open source works that way, that's how we started it, and we, we continue to believe it, and we always uh, continue to keep pushing it. Uh, the second comment is very important, we don't think you're always right. Uh, customers want stuff. Uh, a, we don't, you know, we, we listen, we take input, we, uh, we, we certainly you know, like to hear the stories, we like to hear what you're trying to do, but we believe it is our technical responsibility to be the technical experts in the domain. And we try to use that to guide customers on what the right way to do stuff is. Uh, and so we do, you know, we are somewhat opinionated on technical matters, and that's kind of by design. Uh, that's how it should be, we believe, because that's really about getting people to understand that we spend all of our time worrying and figuring out the stuff that we are trying to build, whereas you are not doing that. You are primarily trying to solve a business problem. You have a particular need you're trying to achieve. And so we better, better darn well know what we're doing and better we have a better opinion and have an understanding of the problem. So, so it's, it's, a, it's a delicate balance we try to make because we obviously want to listen to customers and we hear from them and we understand the needs and so forth. But when it comes to how to solve problems, we try to innovate and come up with ideas uh, and, and approaches for ourselves. <clears throat> uh, the last point is also important. We believe in this concept of iteration in everything. So no technology we build, no product we build, nothing in the space of middleware in today's you know, 2016 timeframe is going to live for another 25 years. Because everything keeps changing. So, so that means we have to be willing to change. We have to be able to work with you to drive that change, adopt that change, and so forth. Uh, so at the same time, we try to look long term. We, we try very hard not to get caught up in the latest buzzword craze. Uh, in our industry, this is a crazy thing, right? Every few years, you come up with another uh, silver bullet buzzword that says, oh, you just do this and everything's fine. And in practice, it's not going to work like that, but everyone jumps on board. You get companies being formed. You get VCs funding it. You get the press going crazy. You get everything happening like that. We tend to avoid that. And if you, if you look at the, the sort of the technology adoption curve, we tend to aim for the long-term path, saying, hey, what's, where's this going to be? What's the real value add of whatever this new buzz is? Figure out what that is and go and implement that and get that done into the platform and, and work with the customers to drive people to that path. Another aspect about a lot of the people, a lot of companies who have platforms is that they grow by, by acquisition. They go and buy something and then put a beautiful marketing around it, say, hey, we have an integrated product set. And that, of course, doesn't work when you try to actually start using it. The, the, the architecture comes apart and it becomes a bunch of disconnected things that you have to work together. Uh, so it's kind of interesting. When I was working on these slides, I, I, I realized that actually we do acquire a lot of stuff. It's just that we don't buy it commercially. We acquire it in the open source sense. And open source technology uh, is by design designed for acquisition in that sense. That is, when you write a piece of code in open source, the only reason you write it is you want some other people to use that piece of code. So it is intended to be embedded into something. It is intended to be integrated to something else. Unlike a proprietary product that you might go and buy from another company, uh, I mean, as a software company, if you go buy another software company, they were designed to keep others out. They were designed to close things up. 
Open source is the opposite. So it works a lot better when it comes to building a platform by acquiring open source technology. Uh, so we, of course, create a whole bunch of open source things ourselves, but we do acquire a lot of open source bits. We, we, I think we have a few hundred open source uh, libraries that we use in our platform. Uh, open source lives on this approach of standing on the shoulders of giants, and we absolutely do that, and we have a lot of people who are building on our open source stack, and we, we have absolutely no problem with that. And, and again, from a customer point of view, a lot of the acquisitions happen because you aren't trying to buy market share. We don't do that. We build the technology, and we, we earn customers who want to adopt that technology. Uh, over the years, over the 10 years, we built an entire middleware platform. We are in about 20 different Gartner and Forrester reports, all of them in, 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 a, in a good position and, and moving in the right direction. Uh, the platform we built is very comprehensive. Uh, you're going to hear about all of these uh, in the course of the two days, uh, different, different product sets and different visions and so forth. I'm not going to get into the details of that at this point. But uh, I, I do want to talk a little bit about what people do with this stuff. Uh, we are about uh, a little bit over 300 customers now. And, uh, and the interesting thing is most of our customers use our products for things that their customers don't know that we exist even. So let me just walk you through a little bit of a journey about some of the customers and what they do, just to give an idea of uh, some of the, the, the ways in which we touch people's lives that, that uh, people may not know. So I'm going I'm to walk you through a few, few uh, steps in this journey. The first one is, so uh, I'm coming here. Uh, let's say I need, to, I need a phone so I can arrange my trip. I go to Motorola and buy a phone. Well, if you buy a phone with Motorola, that's going through WS2 software. Uh, the entire process, all the integration, everything underneath is WS2. So you touch, you buy that phone, you're going through WS2. And then you say, well, I've got to make a, conference, a phone call to, to uh, arrange my trip. Uh, West Corporation is one of our customers. West handles, I think, about 75% of all US conference calls and is a major customer service technology provider in, in, the, in the US. And many of the airlines are their customers. A, well, now I'm going to fly somewhere, so I need to buy a camera. I go to eBay. Well, eBay is our largest volume customer. They do about 6 billion messages a day through our software. Essentially, anything you do on eBay touches WSO2 one way or the other. Uh, you need to get to the airport, you want to Uber it. So great, Uber, if you, uh, Uber uses uh, our CEP engine as its fraud detection mechanism. Uh, now, Uber is not a paying customer, actually. So, so WS2 is an open source platform. So we have lots of people who download and adopt and use WS2 in large-scale production without paying for it. And that's an understood and OK thing. If you're a you know, technology company, we certainly expect that will happen. Uh, I'm flying out on Newark. I go to Newark. I'm on United. Uh, if you go to United, United uh, Terminal in Newark now has a bunch of iBeacons that are integrated to your uh, United app. And it'll tell you how long the, the wait time is on, on the security lines through that. And that's using our analytics to record when people move through past those iBeacons and then analyze that data and compute and tell current approximate wait times for security is about this much. Also lets the gate agents find out, oh, okay, this guy was last seen around there. Right? So instead of them rushing to close the gate, if they know that you're, you, know, you were seen 50 meters away, they could wait for you right? or send a search party to find you. Uh, fly over here, flying on a Boeing plane. Boeing's one of our customers. Boeing has a, 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 a bunch of applications built on, on a digital airline platform that they have built using WC2. Come to London, take the tube. TFL. At the end of the day, every day, all the trains upload a bunch of data going through WS2 technology through TF TFL. Check into the hotel where we are not at Hilton, but if you checked into Hilton, you'd be, you'd be using WS2. Hilton is a, a building, actually a very nice architecture uh, using WS2, kind of reinventing the entire internal middleware platform. I want to go see a show. I go to StubHub and buy a ticket. Again, WS2 software. Pay for it with my credit card. Veryphone is doing lots of interesting integrations with, with uh, not only credit cards, but also allowing third-party payment mechanisms, including like mileage, to be used for paying for something. And uh, again, a WC software. I'm going to go drive over there. I'm going to take a Jaguar or my Land Rover vehicle. Again, uh, their API management platform for all internal innovation is built on WC2. Finally, I'm hungry. Go to Domino's or a pizza. That's from WC2. So, we, we do all these different, different things, but we are completely invisible. None of the customers of this stuff know that we are around, and, and hopefully they will never know we are around, because if they know, that means something went wrong. Right? Your phone doesn't arrive, your pizza doesn't arrive, you see a, some kind of an error message on your screen, that's all bad news from our perspective. So what do we do? So we, 
effectively enable the customers to become a digital business. And we do that a lot right now. So we process more than two trillion messages a day at this point. And we handle all kinds of different business cases, from complicated national security related ones to, to very simple end user applications to you know, all kinds of things. And because we have a comprehensive platform, we can help a customer take a, themselves and move to a fully digital, fully connected, fully integrated architecture, or any step along the way. Uh, we, we have a lot of products. We cover all aspects of the enterprise integration, enterprise application development, enterprise innovation kind of problems. We certainly don't expect every customer to go and buy all these products at once. Right? That's, that's too much to expect. We, we, what we see are people coming with particular use cases, particular scenarios, and they build those. And each one of these might end up touching three, four, five of our products at a time. And then, then eventually, they end up becoming a, more of the platform o over the time. Right. So um, let, me, uh, let me now switch gears a little bit and talk uh, more about the technology. Uh, so uh, before I do that, I just want to kind of uh, touch a little bit upon the need to continue to innovate on, on, the, on the technology space. Middleware, and in fact, all of computer science is just a few decades old. Right. Computing is far from being done in terms of technology innovation. Civil engineering is 5,000 plus years old, and still there's massive innovation happening. So anyone who thinks that computing is done is, is nowhere near uh, realistic. Uh, so we have to keep on innovating. We have to keep on looking at new approaches, new technology, new trends, new research, new ideas, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and figure out how do we create middleware that helps people build what they need to build. Our mission is to enable businesses to do what they want to do and give them absolutely the minimum amount of technology we can create that makes them be maximally productive. Right? So it's kind of an optimization problem we're trying to create. We don't want to create too much stuff because too much stuff means lots of overhead. We don't want to create too little stuff because that means you have to do more work. So there's a right balance that needs to be hit and, and so forth. And at the same time, there's a balance between always looking at new things and always innovating and being providing a stable environment that everyone can just keep executing on. So there's, there's constant challenge between uh, sort of balancing uh, to allow you to do sort of simple integration scenarios to allowing you to do complicated integration things to all kinds of innovative things to creating entirely new business models and so forth. Uh, and and it's, it's not an easy challenge. And of course, one question we always get asked is, um, can I migrate from the older version to the new version? Can I migrate from this product to the next product? How, how do I handle that? And of course, we smile, first of all, when you ask that question. And then we say, yes, you can. There's always a cost and a pain associated with it. And we try to create appropriate migration tools whenever possible. And there are times when it's really not possible. Right? So, so we, we understand that people who adopt technology are always making a commitment. And the commitment is never for one year or for six months. It's usually a much longer commitment. Uh, and, and there are many cases when people say, you know what, this thing's working, I don't want to touch it, and I just want to keep running it for the next 10 years. That's fine, too. Uh, we have some customers who do that and have done that, and, and that's okay. Uh, but at the same time, there are people who say, well, I want to take advantage of, of containers, of IoT, of, of AI, of all these things that are coming along, and how do you help me with that? What's your role in that? And so we, we are constantly balancing those, and we are constantly trying to come up with ways in which we can support you do what you want to do while maintaining the, the, the balance between supporting people who are already working with something and are happy with it and want to keep using that. Uh, so let me, let me talk a little bit about our approach now. This is something I, I started talking about about a year ago. About when we first started the company, the way we looked at a product was focused purely on the runtime. We always had some kind of a server product. You downloaded that, you ran. And then we worked on, on tooling. We had, uh, yeah, tooling was actually, a, unfortunately, a secondary project we started for WSU. That, that was a mistake uh, in the early days and took a while for us to get it corrected. Uh, we have tooling to be a lot more fundamental to the platform. Then last year onwards, we, 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 we created this called the Business Activity Monitor, then evolved that to being the Data Analytics Server. Then from last year, we started working on creating analytics that are integrated to every product. So from the releases that you're seeing coming out from right now, 
when there's a product release, there's a runtime, there's a tool, and there's an analytics component to it. Right? Analytics is, trying, is basically saying, let me tap into all the data that is available in the product and give people everything from a real-time experience with that data, a, a batch experience where we do some static analysis from the results and give you some insights, as well as potentially predictive analytics. Right? So our, our analytics server has a combination of real-time batch as well as uh, predictive uh, machine learning, basically. And we try to combine all of that to give people a good experience in the product in the data that is available from each product. Right? This is now, uh, if, you, if you go to the ESB5 uh, release, uh, ESB5 talk, you will see that there is an a analytics uh, download that you can have for that that naturally integrates with the product. And when you plug it in, you see lots of insight about what's going on in that server at any given time. Right? So this is something we, we've been wanting to do for a long time. We're finally packaging it together and kind of making culture change in the company to say, the product is no longer just a server. It is a combination of all of these things, and we must uh, release all of these things at the same time. So I'm going to touch upon a few areas just to give a quick, very high-level update. Yeah, this is not everything that we've been up to and that we are, we are sort of uh, releasing in, the, in the, the current time frame, but just to give a high-level understanding of some of the key areas. Uh, API Manager 2.0 uh, went into beta today. Uh, uh, there's a lot of analytics stuff. Again, there, for API Manager, there's an analytics component, a companion that comes with it now, you know, which analyzes the data and gives you a lot of insight, uh, including the logs. Uh, so using our log analyzer, so you can get a good understanding of what's going on in the API Manager, how are the API products being consumed, uh, what's the load like, what's the geographic distribution, all of those things, uh, basically. Um, and also, uh, very comprehensive a, a, and high-performant large-scale traffic management infrastructure. This actually came from our work with StubHub. Uh, they, they run a very large uh, deployment with, with high volume, and they needed the, the, a significant set of improvements on how we do real-time uh, monitoring and throttling and, and traffic management. And that's, uh, that's shipping with this version of the product. Um, uh, EMM is the Enterprise Mobility Manager. A, uh, that's a, a, a device management, mobile application management tool. Uh, we spent a lot of time synchronizing that with the IoT server. Uh, the IoT server is, is the next one that's on my list. Uh, IoT server is a full platform for taking some kind of IoT device and creating a complete, uh, everything from capturing data to controlling the device to monitoring the device to managing the device. All of that experience, full, full spectrum, in a integrated architecture, basically. Uh, and EMM, the reason we worked on merging the two at a technical level is because Android devices and, and iOS devices and so forth are really kinds of IoT devices as well. It just happens to be associated with people. Uh, and, and so at a technical level, they're really now the same thing. At a practical level, obviously, there are different use cases and so forth. But uh, we, so that's what the uh, new release uh, has been focused on. And, and a whole bunch more feature improvements and capabilities into the product as well. Uh, IoT servers, uh, really interesting. We're running a beta program. I think there were about 200 people who signed up for the beta program. And the use cases are incredible. They, they range from uh, you know, cattle farming to chicken farming to water quality management to home automation stuff. And, 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 and everything, basically. Right? So it's really quite, uh, quite interesting to see the ways in which people are thinking about connected devices and how you can make a, a business around connected devices. And then using IoT server to do all of that integration and be able to create a, 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 a sellable product, basically, for them. Um, uh, ESP5 release is also coming out uh, very soon. Uh, and, and after a very long time, we've finally done a lot of work on data mapping and, and uh, debugging and tracing. And it took, uh, took a long time, unfortunately, but, but finally it's there. It's been a long requested feature for this product. Uh, and and uh, we're very excited about the, the result and how we believe it will make things a lot more easy for people to create uh, integrations. Also, again, a lot of analytics. There's a corresponding analytics component coming out for ESP5 as well. Uh, um, carbon 5, so I'm going to talk more about Carbon 5 and the future in, in the coming slides. Uh, so carbon, uh, a, carbon is the, the core platform on which all WC products are built. Uh, so in, in, when we started the company in 2005, we had three products on our initial uh, uh, angel investor slide deck, 
and like another seven grayed out saying, at some point, we need to build these things. And the three products were an application server, an integration server, and a process server. We built all those three in various forms, and then another one called governance registry back then. And then we realized this is absolutely crazy because there's so much code overlap between them. So we need to come up with a component way of creating this platform. And, and then uh, uh, we kind of, uh, uh, Paul uh, led the effort to figure out how do we build this component model and ended up adopting OSGI. And Carbon is the, the framework we built, a very thin framework we built on top of OSGI to let us create components, middleware components, and, and create this overall platform. And that's been the dramatic impact on WS2 in terms of how we are able to produce uh, technology and how we are able to produce products. Because even though we ship 25 products, we really have only one product. We have Carbon, and we have about 150 to 200 different features that we've written on top of that. And we package different capabilities with different labels and put it out to the market because that's what the market needs. At a technical level, it's just a feature. It's just an OSGI bundle. We don't really care whether you put that bundle into the, what you call the ESP server or what you call the app server or what you call the data integration server. It doesn't really matter. Right? And so that's been a dramatic impact for us in terms of being able to create a series of products and being able to ship a series of products with an integrated architecture, common user experience, common management, common scalability, all of those things. Uh, and Carbon 5 uh, is the next version that we are working on now. The currently shipping products are shipping on Carbon 4.4. Uh, Carbon 5 is kind of gone back to the roots of the principles on which we, the technology principles on which we started building in 2005 and re-examine them. So one technology principle was uh, that XML and, and, and uh, uh, so information models were going to be fundamental. And in fact, that is still, in most of our products, the XML information model is the fundamental data model. Doesn't mean you have angle brackets coming out in, in memory. It's just a tree. But that's still the fundamental data model. So from Carbon 5, we are changing that and kind of saying there is no uh, data level fundamental common model. It's now it can be JSON, it can be XML, it can be something else, it doesn't matter. And, and uh, we built the entire platform on something called Apache Access 2, which we had created some time before, uh, which is a, a server framework, really. Even though it was a web services engine, it's actually more of a server framework. We use that to create most of our platform capabilities. Again, we're removing that. So Carbon 5 is essentially a total rewrite on the core of the kernel. Right? And then the features will be brought back on top of that, uh, appropriately uh, uh, adjusted. One, uh, by the way, the way we name the platforms, so we take Turing Award winners, and each platform release uh, has, a, has a name associated with that. So the version that we work on is called the Hamming release uh, for, for the, the person who won, I think it was the fourth uh, Turing Award winner. Uh, uh, one of the key things with Carbon 5 is to dramatically change server startup time. And you'll understand why we are picking on this in, in, a, in a few minutes when I talk about uh, some of the other things we are thinking about. Uh, currently, if you download one of the WS2 servers and boot it up, it takes somewhere between 30 to 45 seconds to boot up. And if you have a lot of artifacts to deploy, it'll take even longer because it's going to have to boot up and then go deploy all that stuff. The new target is to be down to one to two seconds. Right? So Carbon Kernel now boots up in about a second or slightly less than a second. It still needs to go down some more. Uh, and, and all servers have to ship with less than two seconds startup time. That's what we're targeting. And you'll understand why in, in a few minutes. Uh, there's a bunch of other stuff we're working on. Uh, uh, we are, uh, so if you've been following the WC2 cloud strategy, we have a public cloud offering called cloud.wc2.com, which is offering right now commercially offering API management. We have an API cloud, essentially our API manager running in the cloud. So if you have low volume scenario or you're happy to have an external API gateway, you don't need to download anything. You just go there, put your email address, create a tenant, and publish your APIs there, and you're done. And you pay based on, on usage, so it starts at like $100 a month, goes up to a couple thousand dollars a month, basically. So it's meant for low volume people primarily, and, and people who are building a, you know, quick applications, and et cetera. Uh, we also have an app cloud there, which is, uh, a, and again, I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, app cloud is a, 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 a rewritten version of what we had as App Factory. Uh, focused on using Docker as a container model for packaging application logic and hosting application logic. Uh, primary design point is, hey, if I have an API and I want to write the backend service and I want to write it as a microservice using MSF4J, 
you can go to App Cloud and create an MSF4J project and just upload your MSF4J jar file and then run, run the uh, microservice in there itself. Uh, integration Cloud is what we're working on now, which is actually taking the ESB capability and bringing it to, again, as a self-service deployment, so you can integrate uh, using any of the 150 plus uh, ESB connectors that we have for cloud uh, APIs and integrate them all and create uh, any kind of integration scenario. Uh, this is, this is uh, working now. It's going to go into alpha very soon, I, I, I believe within a few days or a week or weeks maximum. Um, there's another big thing we're working on for API Manager. This is not for the immediate coming release. This is a future release uh, version that we're working on, which is a, a, a some of you have may, may, may have read an, uh, an article written by a guy called Dan Jacobson from Netflix. And, and the title was very provocative. It was written as, just say no to rest. And that's not really what the message is. But uh, what, what his message was that if you create a single API following all the beautiful rest principles and so forth, that single API, the behavior of that API may not suit all the different use cases that API might get used for. And it came from Netflix, where Netflix was creating, uh, they have an API for their backend, and then they have 80 different device types that they support. All the clients are written by them. They don't publish a public API. But different device types, when you're on a phone versus when you're on a 65-inch TV versus a laptop, the experience that you want to show to the user is different about the movies that are available or whatever you're going through Netflix. Of course, if you have a single API, that means you have to keep calling that API, get all the data, and change the experience on the client side, which can be inefficient, especially if you're on a phone. You might have to get a lot of data that you're not interested. And if you design to make the phone case work better, then when you're on a 55-inch TV with a, with a high bandwidth connection, you're going to have to make lots of calls in order to get all the data that you want to show one, one thing on the screen. Again, not efficient. So they came up with this model of allowing the application developer to effectively customize the server-side API by uploading a, a composite API definition to the server. In their case, it's easy because it's on a, on a controlled environment. The trusted developers are uploading code to the server. So we've kind of generalized this. We have this concept of personalizing APIs. We are allowing a, a, a model where within the API gateway, you can say, I want to reshape or recompose these APIs that are available on this API gateway. And look at it like this, and here's my composition rules. And it's written in a declarative form that we can validate is safe. And then once you upload that, run it, you get your own custom endpoint that has the APIs working just the way you want them to work, instead of the way the API designer designed them. Right? So, so again, making composition and, and adoption of APIs easier by allowing the API user to tune it to the shape and feel they want to receive the data and information in. Um, Another thing we are working on is this thing called an update server. This is a, uh, it's working now. We will be releasing it very shortly, uh, at least as an alpha. One of the problems that we've had in, in the WC platform is when, whenever there are updates or patches, uh, you open a support ticket, we attach the support, uh, the patch to the support ticket, and you get the security patch. But uh, it's a bit of a pain. You have to get notified. You have to go there, download the file, copy the file, install it, you know, build your uh, production configuration, and deploy it again, and so forth. Uh, so the update server is mirrored along very much like the Linux update stuff or Windows update model. You run an update server that subscribes to the WS2 update server, and it just gets notified whenever there are new changes, and pulls every once in a while and gets notified. And then once it notices if you are using a particular version of a product, if there are new versions, it will download those updates, rebuild a pack that has all the updates in it, and, and send a message saying, hey, I've got a later version of it. And now you can go through the process of actually deploying it onto the next, onto production or whatever the, your process uh, demands that you execute. Um, uh, this is actually our first exploration also into Go. Uh, uh, so as a, as a company, we built all our middleware in Java. Uh, for the for first 10 years, and we're still building all our servers in Java. Uh, I personally uh, think that Go offers a potential long-term path for being a Java next. Uh, Java 8 actually has bought itself another 5, 10 years of life by the way it merged all the functional capabilities. Uh, but Go is very interesting for doing this kind of system-like applications. So this code is actually written in Go. Uh, so it's our first thing we've written in Go, and we see us doing more of the tooling, uh, this kind of system-level tooling in probably Go as we go along. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how that works out and, and how far we take that along. Um, the last one is also kind of interesting. This is a thing we are doing for ourselves, first of all. 
so we build all these different user experience with lots of different web applications with different, uh, different user experiences. And when you download the API manager and look at the store, when you learn the app manager and look at the store, when you download the enterprise store and look at the governance registry, they all look and feel the same. And the reason is they're all built on the same code base underneath. But the way we've done it is, is still not flexible enough because they all have to inherit from the enterprise store framework and then build these things. But uh, the problem is if I just want to have a store experience for one part of my UI and have a different user experience for the other parts of an application I'm building, you can't use the store framework because store framework is holistic. You buy into that, everything is, looks and feels and operates like a store. Yeah, so what we are trying to create is this concept of a uh, uh, UUF is a working name. It'll, it'll not be the name we ship it with. Uh, it's a way of creating essentially application components. Uh, so Carbon solved the problem of server-side components for us. Uh, and in fact, Carbon admin consoles have this concept. Carbon admin consoles have something called Carbon UI framework, which is how the admin consoles are built. It's actually an OSGI application that assembles all the UI bundles together to create an admin console for a product. Uh, as you boot it up. It's something a little bit similar to that, where we are creating a component model where you can write client-side logic and server-side logic and corresponding back-end services, bundle them together, tell which URL space it occupies, and then have a model where say, I'm building an application. It's based on the following base application. I need the following dependent components. And they will populate your URL space from that. And then you get this. And the components are aware of the layouts of the pages. They merge into the UIs that have been already designed, et cetera. Right? So this is something necessary if you are creating lots of applications with a common base. So there are thousands of JavaScript frameworks. There are thousands of MVC frameworks. There's all kinds of stuff out there. Most of them are focused on the problem of taking one application and building it really, really fast and really productively. What the challenge that we have and what the challenge we see a lot of enterprises having is they don't create one application. They create lots of applications that consume the same set of back-end services. Uh, and, and therefore, providing a common look and feel across them and being able to having, uh, have a framework that lets people write common components that other people can consume easily is important. So we're doing this primarily for ourselves first, but then we also expect to release it. And then you know, if people want to use it, we're happy to uh, provide support for it. So these are all sort of a set of things that we're working on short term uh, and medium term. These are all things that we will be shipping within the course of this year. But I also want to spend a little bit of time talking about uh, big picture stuff, like macro trends and what we are looking at doing for each of these things. Um, and and uh, I'm not going to spend much time. I'm, I'm nearly out of my time now. But I just want to give you an understanding of some of these areas that are sort of a, evolving and, and getting a lot of attention and see how it affects the middleware platform and what we are doing about it. So IoT, we've already talked about, really. Yeah, IoT is a big one. Everybody is you know, recognizing there's going to be a huge impact from IoT on, on the volume of data, on the volume of compute, uh, and so forth, business models, et cetera. Uh, IoT server uh, is our first uh, foray into that to create uh, a technology platform that if you are trying to create the next Nest-like experience, you can take IoT server and build that very quickly and very easily. Uh, uh, along with that, we'll be taking this to the cloud. There'll be a device cloud offering that'll let you uh, do the same thing uh, hosted in a cloud environment. And again, IoT analytics are part of the IoT server offering as well. And again, analytics are going to be even more important than the ability to just uh, receive the data, but to be able to process and, and compute uh, with the data. Uh, Enterprise and IoT are becoming more and more integrated. Most of the IoT scenarios that we hear about today are not in enterprise scenarios. They are more consumer-facing, sort of end-user cases. But there's a lot more happening in that space, so, so we are also uh, part of that process as well. Uh, the biggest one that really affecting how we think about our software, and one of the reasons why this one to two second thing is very important, is containers. Uh, so containers is, a, uh, is not a new technology, first of all. I was talking to somebody yesterday. I can't remember who it was. Uh, you know, containers have been around in Unix from 1980s, if I remember right. Uh, Berkeley had something called Charoot. Uh, Solaris had jails. Same concept. What Docker has done is really commoditize that. It's just like what uh, AWS uh, and, 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 uh, and, and Linux really did with Zen and KVM and so forth, commoditizing expensive virtualization and spawned an entire different kind of compute paradigm, Docker has completely commoditized and made a lot more accessible 
the container-based execution model. And a container is basically a, a, not an OS. It's, it's a thing that looks and feels like a full machine, but it doesn't have the cost of a full machine. It's really just a collection of processes working together, constrained to operate within a completely virtual space. A process is just virtual memory. A container is virtual memory, virtual address space, virtual network space, et cetera. So a virtual file system. So you get a complete computer, quote unquote, uh, running within that container. Um, when you have containers, and containers can boot up very fast, so you can create an isolated execution environment in, in no time because it's just a process coming up. So if you can bring up a container very fast and it takes you 30, 40, 50 seconds to boot up your server, that's, you know, then you might as well bring up a VM because a VM takes 30 seconds to boot up or less and bring up your server. It doesn't make a difference. One of the things about containers is, is also the ability to on-demand scale out and, and on-demand bring something up because somebody is now doing something. So Gmail is apparently the, uh, has been using containers for 10 years. And they, if I remember right, the, at a talk they gave last year, they said they spin up 2 billion containers a week. Every time you log into Gmail, there's a container that comes up for your mail, right? So they, and, and just sort of an endpoint that's running just for you, basically. Uh, uh, to compute in that mode requires a server architecture in a different mode. And there are other things that come from this, this kind of architecture. So one thing is rapid start. You have to be able to start a server up quickly. Otherwise, when somebody goes to Gmail, you can't wait 45 seconds. You know, you have very little tolerance. Very, people have very little patience. So you need to come up immediately. Memory usage has to be minimal. Uh, one of our servers right now, I think, won't boot up unless you have like 200 MB of memory, which is OK if you're going to boot up the server, let it run for six months, and install a bunch of stuff, and deal with a bazillion number of messages hitting it for six months or whatever. Right? Then so what? It's OK. But if you're going to boot it up and execute something and get out of the way, that's not OK. Uh, then, then it becomes a problem. Another concept of containers that is very important, and this is kind of where microservices is coming from as well, is this concept of single function and immu immutability, which is I define an environment, a container, just to do one thing. And it, whenever it's born and it's running, it only does that one thing. And if I don't want it to do that one thing, I just blow it away. That's it. I kill it. I delete the file. I'm done. Right? If I want to do something else, I go and uh, boot up another I configure another one and boot that up. So there's no concept of deployment anymore in that world. Right? So, so in our current architecture, in everything, we design servers with the mindset that servers come up. They look around to see, what am I supposed to do? And go deploy those things, and then handle those, uh, provide those capabilities. With containers, it's gone. There is no concept of deployment, because the container image is already pre-deployed. Whatever you want to run is already in there. Uh, so again, kind of changes the server architecture. Uh, long running. So in our current products, we design our servers to have as much as possible zero memory leaks, uh, flat line memory behavior, and so forth, right? For long running behavior. You want to run it for months and months and months, not worry about it, and it just keeps on working. In a container, if the thing comes up in a second, and it can be brought up whenever somebody needs something, or you have a few things running, and, and, and they rapidly move around, I don't need that anymore. Uh, you know, it's OK if, it, if, it doesn't, uh, if the server doesn't behave that well. Because I can run it for 30 seconds, kill it, put another one up. Right? This is a dangerous path, because it encourages people to say, well, don't worry about memory again. Right? This is not a good path. Uh, that's why you can't boot a piece of Java code without 20 MB of memory. Uh, but it is, it is a real thing. The, the effort that we spend to make a server run with zero memory leaks and flat memory usage is, is incredible amount of work. Right? And, and uh, in a containerized world, it's kind of not necessary anymore, because you run it for a few minutes or a few seconds or whatever, and kill it and boot another one up. Uh, again, no consider dispatching, because all the dispatching, all the routing to a container is now outsourced to someone else. And it's some kind of container management, some runtime environment. Kubernetes, OpenShift, Mesos, all of these things. So the Amazon Container Service, the Google Container Service, uh, Microsoft is having one as well, et cetera. So, so, um, we are looking at how middleware needs to run in a containerized world. And in order to support that, we, uh, we believe that the current server architectures, while they can run on containers, I know some of you run on containers, they are not sort of container-native execution. You're kind of treating a container as a lightweight, somewhat lightweight VM when you're running WC2's current products, or not only WC2, anybody's current products in a containerized environment. 
And that's good enough for many cases. But if you really want to take advantage of containers on a long-term basis, that's not good enough. You have to be able to run in a manner that is native for this environment. So that's, that's a big reason why we are rewriting the entire platform on, on this carbon-5 kernel, basically, right? which is completely changing this model, saying we have to operate within this environment, not in the older server environment as well. Uh, just a quick sidebar on why we did MSF4J, which is this microservices framework for Java. People are saying, well, there's Spring Boot, there's Drop Wizard, there's a bunch of these things. Why do you go do that thing? Well, it's because all the other down things are not really micro at all. Spring Boot takes 700 megabytes of memory when you boot it up. Right? And if you're going to bring up a process just to handle one request, and it's going to need 700 megabytes of memory just to say, hello, I'm around, and then handle the request and go away, that's kind of silly, because that means you can't run lots of containers. The machine eventually has physical memory limits. Right? So MSA4J is an entirely different kind of base. It just starts quickly, does its thing, and goes away. Uh, 20 megabytes you know, is, is not, not really bad. From, it's, it's very good from a Java sense. It's embarrassing if you're a C programmer. Uh, but you know, in the Java world, this is OK. 20 megabytes, nobody worries about it now. Uh, so Carbon 5, as I said, is, is the container-native platform that we're working on. Right? It's designed to be, uh, it'll work well in traditional VMs as well. Nobody gets upset if you can run with less memory or, and less delay and less uh, 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 CPU usage and so forth. But uh, it's fundamentally designed to all work really, really well in containerized environments. Uh, and really, uh, it is not possible to just take existing code and say, oh, we run in a container and everything's perfect. Right? That's going to be what uh, Paul invented this term and the cloud stuff was coming along called cloud native. And, and in fact, cloud native is now a widely deployed uh, term. And, and at the time, there was this thing called cloud washing as well. Everybody said, oh, we run in a cloud. All it meant was I built an AMI on Amazon. It's in the Amazon store, and you can boot it up. And, and, and it takes a lot more than that to really work in, in a cloud environment. The same thing is going to be true here. Um, integration. So we've been doing ESB stuff and so forth for a long time. Uh, we started the Synapse project, which was the root of our ESB in 2005. Uh, IBM, uh, Oracle, Mule, all these guys have ESBs. They all fundamentally are the same thing, which is there's some kind of a data flow paradigm. There's some kind of you know, programming language, a configuration language, where you say in XML or non-XML, doesn't really matter. You, know, you get this, then you do this, and so forth. But uh, uh, so we, in our next version of our integration architecture, we are totally rethinking that and kind of going to a model of sequence diagrams as a fund fundamental way of designing integrations. What we found is whenever we had complicated things to talk to customers about and complicated integration, complicated race conditions, and so forth, you always draw a sequence diagram to say, this is what's happening. This guy does this, and this guy does this, and so forth. And sequence diagrams are a great way to describe parallel activities and how they depend on each other, which is primarily what integrations are about. So we are now creating a, a runtime and model and language to be able to model everything as sequence diagrams. And you run that, and that's your uh, integration, basically. Along with that comes this concept of micro-integrations, which is really a microservice-like concept, which is single function integrations. Again, our current server architecture, our mental model is you take an ESP, you run a central ESP. You deploy all the integrations onto that. Uh, in a more decentralized environment, you say, well, I'll just, I have this one integration. I'm going to run it in a container just by itself. So it's like a micro integration, basically. A, just a, a single function integration just there, just to do that, and nothing else. And nobody will ever deploy something else in there, et cetera. Uh, there's a talk about this. Uh, Kasun in the city is talking about it today. If you're interested, please do go attend. Uh, so microservices, there's a lot of religious uh, you know, stuff going on about microservices, how it's much better, every problem is solved with microservices. Uh, I don't believe any of that, because microservices have the same problem that SOA has, which is you have to design it correctly. And if you don't design it correctly, you're going to end up in a mess just as much as you can end up with SOA or any other distributed systems architecture that you design and implement. So, at a technical level, there is, there is really no fundamental technology variation. It is still HTTP, it is still JSON, it is still REST, et cetera. Uh, there is some uh, thing about being able to provide a minimal runtime. That is why we create MSF4J again. Because to say, I'm going to run one service, and I'm going to just do one thing, and I'm going to deploy one JAXRS, and I'm going to go and download 
uh, Jack Saris engine and running on top of Tomcat and have 100 megabytes of stuff just to handle simple HTTP requests is kind of crazy, right? And that's, uh, that's the current reality. So MSF4J is like entirely different uh, uh, experience on that. Again, there's another component of this uh, microservices religion which says there's no such thing called an ESP because everyone's going to design services perfectly right and no one will ever need to integrate services and no one will ever need to version services and so forth because you're going to get it right. Well, good luck with that. If you can do that, uh, you guys are better than uh, anyone I've ever met. Uh, uh, but typically, you can't do that. You design services just as much as the API composition kind of stuff. Consumption requires different experiences. And over time, the service expectations change. Uh, and just because you have a service doesn't mean you want to expose it to the outside. So what it does is, in some way, the API gateway becomes like the new ESB. And again, just relabeling one box to another box is not a good thing. So from an architecture perspective, there are scenarios when it's good to do some composition inside an API gateway level. There are scenarios when you should do some more composition somewhere else. And there are scenarios when you don't do any composition at all, and you expose the service directly as an externally available API. All of these cases make sense. And so my advice for microservices is don't get caught up in the hype. You know, microservices uh, is a good thing. Doing services right is a good thing. Uh, minimizing dependencies, creating single function behavior is a good thing. And, and, uh, and picking the right way to run those things is, is good. So cloud is a big one that, that obviously everybody is, uh, you know, it's not new. But what's, what's happening in a way is a, uh, the platform, sorry, that should say AMZN, um, the cloud providers are becoming much more platform providers over time. Uh, to be honest, we consider Amazon and Microsoft as our biggest long-term competitive threats, not IBM and Oracle anymore. Right? IBM and Oracle own the market. They have all kinds of stuff and so forth. But over the next 20 years, the ones that are best poised to offer a, a middleware for customers is not those two, but the other two. Uh, of course, they are, the cloud is like the most incredible lock-in experience. If you buy into all the Amazon services, you are stuck in Amazon for the rest of your life because you can never move. There are no standards. There's nothing. It's completely proprietary. If you buy into all the Microsoft services, the same story. So that's where we see ourselves offering a common platform across all these things. And as part of that, we already run our public cloud, but we are getting more and more towards saying all of our products will have a cloud experience as well, and not really just as separate products, but as integrated experiences that cover complicated use cases that allow you to combine a, a one endpoint with another and so forth. This is really why Lambda is interesting from Amazon, uh, which is a very nice uh, piece of technology, certainly worth looking at it, yeah, and Google Functions and so forth, which is really about saying I can create an endpoint. It's just an HTTP endpoint, but it's not just sitting by itself. You can associate that with all these other capabilities and make it be a lot more interesting. In order to do that, you need to have the whole platform in the cloud. And that's, again, something that we are heading towards of saying we are going to offer the whole platform in the cloud and offer portability across different uh, infrastructure clouds which is the way we want to look at these other guys. Uh, machine learning and AI, we have a machine learner product, which is part of the data analytics server as well. A, again, very big area, lots and lots of interest now. Everyone wants to figure out how do I do machine learning, deep learning, AI, within your whatever problem space. Our challenge first is a, we are trying to integrate that to our own products so that when we analyze data, when we extract data and process it, we can apply the appropriate levels of intelligence and give you insights. Uh, we are doing that with our identity server, the next version of the identity server, I can't remember which version that's shipping with analytics, will have a bunch of uh, fraud detection machine learning algorithms that are built into it. Uh, so it'll, it'll compute a, a bunch of stuff and tell you when there is a, a, what appears to be a fraudulent login attempt, for example. Right? Like that, we are planning to integrate as much of uh, sort of pre-designed uh, intelligence into the products, and then also enable you to do whatever kinds of uh, intelligent analysis that you want. Because in many cases, we really can't just create machine learning uh, algorithms, uh, apply machine learning algorithms on the data and say, oh, here, here's an you know, answer for you, or, or here's an uh, you know, model that you can apply to make decisions or whatever, because that's very domain dependent. So you need to do that. And our, our mission is to make it possible to, for you to do that for the most part. OK. so. Uh, so these are a whole bunch of areas that we are, we are, we are working on in terms of uh, uh, sort of new scope, new uh, problem spaces that we know we need to pay attention to and that we need to evolve with. Uh, and so 
our approach is always we question ourselves all the time. Our approach is we build things quickly, we, we play around with it, we experiment, and then we ask, does that make any sense? And kind of go back again, right? And, and we don't generally, we try very hard not to sit on something we've done before and say, okay, that problem is solved. Uh, fundamentally, because really nothing in computer science is really solved yet. So, so we try very hard to keep innovating. At the same time, it's always a challenge for, for customers because when you innovate all the time, it becomes a, a, a challenge for people. But we, we try to make that balance work uh, and, and we work with you to make it work. Uh, the key thing is we tend to look long term. We don't worry about short term stuff. We tend to look at a technology level long term. We tend to the, uh, look at the way we work with you on long term. We try hard to try to think on not just what happens in the next three months, six months. You know, This company was not set up to just make some money and go away and go do something else. This company was set up with the vision to be a middleware platform that is here forever as a middleware platform. And from that light, we have to think long term and we have to keep on evolving and, and adjusting as, as the world changes. Um, so of course we know you have lots of choices, but we do have fundamental advantages that nobody else has, which is we are the only company that has actually ever built a complete platform and ever done that with an integrated architecture with a singular vision about how that platform is supposed to work and continue to evolve that vision over time as well. That all the other competitors, you know, everything from our point focus competitors to platform competitors, they don't, haven't done that. Uh, it's not easy to do it. It's been a long process to get here, and, and it's something we have to keep on going with. So before I finish, let me just finish you, uh, leave you with this quote. Uh, this is, uh, you know, Steve Jobs had lots of interesting quotes. Uh, this is something that really guides a lot of the work we do. Uh, it basically says, you don't always know how things are going to line up over time. You have to keep doing a bunch of things, and have to have some faith, some gut belief that this set of things will get together and, and line up to do what you are really looking to do on a long-term basis, right? And, and that's a, a, a point into the long-term nature of the way we think and the way we evolve uh, our technology and, and, and the business and how we work with you. Okay, thank you very much. Sanjeev, it was great listening to your speech today. Um, one of the things I was, uh, there was, took so many notes, but one of the things I was struck by was when you talked about this concept of the unified user interface, the UUF, and the fact that more enterprises are creating multiple applications, and that really seems to be part of this digital transformation. Um, any more thoughts on that that you could bring in terms of what you're seeing with your own customers? Sure. Um, so let me, let me go back to my IBM days. When, when, we were in, when I was in IBM, I think there were 40,000 different applications that IBM had inside the company. And, and nobody even knew where they were. They, they couldn't find them. The only way you knew was somebody told you, saying, you need to use this application to do that, and then you can use that. And so of course, it creates a lot of redundant uh, creation, a lot of redundant innovation, because you don't know it's there, you go create another one. Uh, and that's why we created the App Manager product, actually, as a, as a way of creating an app store within an enterprise so people can discover things. And then uh, when you do that, the next step is you don't want the, uh, the bar that people have within the enterprise on consumability of applications is much, much higher now uh, than it was five, ten years ago. Uh, so, so in order to give people a solid user experience, you need to create a, a model where all applications exhibit a certain quality of user experience and have some common styles, some common guidance, and so forth. And that's really what motivated us to do that. Uh, again, coming primarily from our side, but we've heard from lots of customers about how they, again, have to build lots and lots of applications. And uh, one of our financial service customers, for example, has developed a, a fairly complicated framework, uh, framework, one client-side MVC framework, one server-side MVC framework, um, and they are very productive with it. They can create one application very fast, but it's not a good way to create a, a common user experience. It's not a good way to be able to create a series of applications. And, and that's really the problem that we are we're trying to create. Solve, right? sorry. Great. Um, now, I think there are a couple microphones out there. Let's see. It's hard to see. Um, do we have people? I, does anyone have a question they'd like to ask of Sinjiva? I, this was my favorite part, because when do you ever get to just grab him and ask whatever you want? Um, and I have more questions in case you don't, but do we have someone out here who'd like to ask anything? Did you see? 
Well, while we're waiting, um, you know, one of the other things is you talked about IoT server being new, but one of the things that struck me is that um, you have been working with Internet of Things, um, with customers on their Internet of Things deployments for years now, and a lot of what's in IoT server, there are some new things, but a lot of it is built on real-world experiences of using WSO2 technology to solve those. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, so uh, IoT server, like every other product from WSO2, is built on carbon. Uh, an IoT server actually uh, aggregates the API manager inside, uses the app server, uses the analytics platform, uh, uses a whole host of components that are common across the platform. Uh, some of the customers that have done uh, IoT projects with us, so Pacific Controls is one of our customers, and they have built uh, this entire Dubai uh, uh, platform for managing all the buildings, and that's, uh, th that's a very comprehensive IoT platform, very enterprise, uh, uh, industrial IoT kind of scenario. And like that, there's, uh, uh, Trimble has built something which is a, for monitoring uh, uh, Caterpillar machines, et cetera. So, so there's a series of things that people have built that have evolved, that helped us evolve what the IoT server became. Um, and, and what we've noticed is the, the capabilities of modeling a device as an API, the capability of being able to define event streams and track all the sensor data and get it to an integrated analyzable form is really what was needed in a packaged model. And that's what IoT server was constructed as. And, and the, the use cases that we are seeing from, from the beta has been incredible and really given a, a tremendous uh, you know, va validation of the approach in terms of the range of things people are doing with it and how uh, productively they seem to be doing it. We, we have a few more weeks left in the beta program, so we'll see how, what the results come out. But so far, it looks pretty good. Yeah, and um, I did get a sneak peek into some of those use cases, and it looks like there's an interesting combination of people that are creating new products that you might use in the consumer realm, but they're also uh, another group that are enterprises that are looking to optimize their supply chains or manufacturing or some of the other operations. Seems like a good mix. Uh, absolutely. It's an incredible uh, spectrum of applications that are in there. Uh, would anyone like to ask a question? Hi, Sanjeev. Um, I'm interested in this concept uh, uh, from Netflix um, around the API personalization. And, you know, I see a lot of benefits in it, but is there any risks around gov on the governance side that you could get a proliferation of um, services that you now have to maintain? So I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on that in terms of how can you govern and, and manage um, a wider set of APIs? Uh, thank you. So, so um, uh, that is always a challenge. So, so it's, it's kind of a challenge between having a controlled environment where you are fully in control of the, the services and the APIs and allowing somebody to go and create something else and then other people depending on it and so forth. Uh, there's, no, there's no right answer, wrong answer there in my view. We, we definitely see on a long-term basis if you allow uh, a compositions and then compositions on top of compositions, and so forth, you will create another kind of spaghetti layer that is very difficult to unravel and very difficult to govern. Uh, so our initial pass is to say, we are not going to allow compositions to be composed uh, for a start. So if you create an API and it's a composite API, sorry, but you cannot use that to create another API. Uh, so that's one level composition, is, is one, one uh, way of controlling it. Uh, the next level is how much of sharing you allow with that. Uh, so again, our recommendation is initially you say, well, if I want to create a composition for or, or a customized API for myself, and I go and create it by composing these other things, then I can do it, but I'm not allowed to share it. That's one level of it. So I can create one for myself, as in me, as in my application that is being writing it, right? Uh, and then the next level is, of course, you can share it within your team. You can, you know, within whatever the level of governance that you want to allow, and potentially just publish it back. Uh, as, as a sort of a, an API, but that cannot be composed effectively. 
So th there's a variety of control points that you have. And I think uh, it's best to start with the most amount of control, because once you give it away, you can't take it back. Uh, so if you start with saying, hey, you can only compose for yourself, you can't even share it, that's the starting point. Great, that was a really good question. Uh, do we have another one yes. from the audience? Oh, here over here. Uh, hi, Jack Hennison from Weave. Um, I found the uh, items you were talking about with the next um, phase of your architecture most interesting with um, integration.next and microservices. And, um, it feels like there's a roadmap kind of um, that you're just at the beginning of, and I'm interested in how long you think that roadmap is and, and what will drop out when and, and how long this transformation of your product architecture might take. Okay. Uh, <laughs> When is this going to ship question? Uh, so we don't generally have long roadmaps. Uh, you know, the main reason is we don't believe we can project what's going to happen in five years in this technology space. We can barely project what's going to happen in two years. But one thing about technology is everyone gets all hyped up about it, saying, oh, this is hot now and it's going to change the world. But it takes 10, 15 years to really change the world. Uh, everything has taken like that, whether it's a web or a REST or SOA or anything, it takes time. Uh, but uh, at the same time, from, from a platform delivery perspective, so the carbon fiber work is ongoing, the kernel is done. Uh, we expect to start shipping products on that this year. Uh, so we are working on, I believe, the business process server, data services server, and the new ESP integration runtime is all on carbon fiber. Those will ship this year. Uh, so that's the containerized experience, the container-ready experience, let's say. Uh, on, on some of the other things, like machine learning and so forth, again, ongoing activity. It's not a future roadmap uh, statement. So really, everything that I went through is a roadmap, but at the same time, we have a lot of incremental release plans for each of those areas. Uh, the integration architecture is, uh, you know, we have working code now. Uh, again, target is to release it this year uh, with tooling, with analytics, uh, with full experience, and so forth. Uh, so, so it's not really a long-term roadmap. It is more of a series of things that we are guiding based on the environment changing for how people will use software and how kinds of things people will create, but trying to deliver it as quickly as possible. Now, it doesn't mean that if you are writing integrations using the current ESP, you should stop writing integrations using the current ESP. That doesn't make any sense. Uh, the, this is more of a, when you are thinking sort of next generation of your architecture, when you're thinking internally beyond a VMware deployment and calling that cloud, which is what most enterprises are at yet, and kind of thinking about, OK, we are going to go to a more containerized environment, and, and how we will operate in that, uh, then this software becomes much more interesting. Do we have another question? Well, one of the things I was curious about is, um, you were talking right in the early stages of your, your discussion today about trying to sort through the hype versus the reality of implementing. And you know now there is a lot of hype around digital transformation and what's involved with that. How do you and the team at WSO2 work with customers to help them get beyond the hype and to really implement um, a solution that's going to meet their needs? It's uh, a good question. So, so uh, uh, what we see uh, uh, is there are, uh, there's a whole range of businesses. Uh, there's a whole sort of spectrum of digital readiness within organizations. Uh, companies that are primarily cloud-based cloud applications and cloud-based services are naturally digital ready because they were born and lived in that experience, in that environment. Uh, for many others, they are sort of in, in what I will call level one of integration, which is I just need this data from this application to get to that data from that application and, and keep them consistent. Uh, sort of, you know, almost the old world of uh, old word of enterprise application integration is still a very real problem for many, many people. Uh, so so uh, from a roadmap perspective, that's the first thing. You have to get all these siloed applications uh, getting consistent, getting data integration, and so forth working. Uh, the next level is really enabling access to those things for internal and external consumption. And typically, it comes, in many cases, it comes external first, interestingly. 
because you're under pressure from some external scenario to open up a particular channel. Uh, and that's where really marketing or customer-facing functions drive how that gets exposed. Uh, so then you end up creating some kind of an API story facing the outside world. Then you realize, oh, OK, actually, that same story works perfectly well inside the company, except instead of exposing one API, I really want to expose hundreds of APIs, because I want to keep, take the entire enterprise functionality, make it available as internal integration innovation platform. Um, and that's really the kind of the three stages that, that uh, we, need to, we need to execute. Uh, and, and we see that happening over and over again with customers. And depending on where people are, we work with them at the right level. In some cases, it's you know, traditional integration stuff. In some cases, it's a lot more forward-looking, you know, building communities, running internal platform development, running internal hackathons, and, and sort of creating this environment where internal innovation becomes unleashed through APIs and through application composition and so forth. Great. I think we're supposed to wrap up. All right. Well, I think that was a great way to end the discussion today. Sajiva, thank you so much. Thank you.